Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to make a start. Uh, welcome to tonight's webinar for women who are considering their options after being diagnosed as a carrier of the BRCA1 and or BRCA2 gene. My name's Jess Hills. I'll be hosting the evening and I'll introduce our panel and um, guest experts shortly. I'd like to start with a very special thank you to those who encouraged us to hold this evening's event. Uh, that was health professionals, patients, family members and um, the general community. I would especially like to acknowledge our event partners and thank them for their support. Uh, I'd like to thank Peter McCallum Familiar Cancer Centre, uh, Breast Cancer Network Australia, Pink Hope and Cancer Councils across Australia. A little bit of housekeeping to start off with. Uh, the participant lines and microphones are muted, so hopefully you can hear us, but we can't hear you, just to uh, minimise background noise. Uh, you'll be using the chat box to communicate with us and each other, so I'll show you that shortly. If you're having trouble hearing, try turning up your sound on your computer. Alternatively, you can dial in via the numbers um, on the screen, so I'll just put those up now. Please note that during the guest expert presentation by Lucinda Hossack, there will, be an there will be no opportunity to ask questions. The chat box for you to type in your questions um, live will be open after the formal presentation and I'll let you know when this is the case. It is important to note that it is a condition of participating that you appreciate that everyone may have a different opinion and we ask that all viewpoints are respected. Our forum will teach will touch on the personal impact of a diagnosis of carrying a gene fault that um, may create issues such as fertility, family planning, body image, navigating relationships for those with a partner and those without, and more general information on preventative action including surgery and the use of tamoxifen. Our evidence has shown that talking with people in the same or a similar situation and understanding practical issues related to your condition can reduce some of the fear and worry um, and sense of isolation people with BRCA gene and their partners and families may experience. This is why we believe this webinar is an important way to bring people from across Australia and our international guests together to discuss these issues. It is important to understand each person's situation is different and therefore uh, may have complex uh, issues related to their situation which will require expert medical advice. For these reasons we cannot discuss specific situations or provide medical advice on treatment or implications relating to your personal family history. Rather, this webinar will provide the opportunity to connect with others and hear from those who understand what you're going through because they've been through a similar situation themselves. For all your questions related to your treatment options or concerns about family history, we would refer you back to your treating specialist or familiar cancer centre. If you still have unanswered questions or concerns, you may then choose to seek a second opinion. At the end of the formal presentation, anyone who would like the opportunity to discuss or ask questions relating to coping with the diagnosis to our panellist or guest expert Lucinda will have the opportunity do, to do so via our discussion board. Again, I will let you know when this is the case. During this part of our webinar, the same rules apply about respecting other people's um, different viewpoints. Of course, your participation in our forum is very important and we, if we are unable to meet your needs, or those of your family or partner and you still have questions, uh, please feel free to call the helpline on 13 11 20 in your state. Before we get started, I'll just clarify what this evening's webinar is about. The webinar is designed as a forum to discuss the issues that can arise from a diagnosis of being a BRCA1 and or BRCA2 carrier and how this may affect families and partners. So I will say at this point, if you are concerned about family history, yet haven't been diagnosed as a carrier um, of the BRCA1 and or BRCA2 gene fault, you may benefit more from watching the recording of the Breast Cancer in My Family webinar that we held earlier this year. In a similar way, if you already know that you have a gene fault and have already taken steps to reduce your risk, again, the next hour may not be best suited to your needs, although of course we're very happy to have you stay online. So I'll just go through a brief outline um, of this evening. Um, we'll start with a presentation from Lucinda Hossack um, and then we're going to have audience Q&A with our guest panel um, of Sarah, Christy and Samantha that we'll introduce you to shortly. 
Um, and then we'll obviously go over the uh, support services that are available to you and um, then finish with the evaluation. So why are we having a webinar? A bit of background. Um, since Angelina Jolie announced her double mastectomy earlier this year, there has understandably been increased community awareness and concern. We responded to this identified need with an evidence-based information um, webinar called Breast Cancer in the Family, held on the 24th of June earlier this year for the, those with more general questions about um, family risk. This is available on YouTube or on Cancer Council Victoria's um, website and the link is there. Um, don't panic, you don't have to copy it down, we'll send you the link um, tomorrow with the follow-up information from the webinar. From um, I guess this webinar we held back in June, it was evident that those who knew they were a carrier of a gene fault and were facing decisions about what to do next may benefit from a dedicated forum to discuss these issues. Women wanted to hear from other women who understood what they were going through because they had been there themselves. I'll firstly introduce Lucinda Hossack. She's our guest expert this evening. Some of you may know her. She works at the uh, Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and has nine years experience as a clinical genetic counsellor. In her work, she works to help families understand how their family history of cancer impacts on their personal and close family members' cancer risk. She also informs individuals and families about their options available to manage and to detect cancer early or reduce that risk. Lucinda loves reading and spending time with her family, especially her husband and gorgeous two little girls, and she has one on the way. Carol Arbuckle will be facilitating the discussion this evening. Carol is an experienced oncology and palliative care nurse. Uh, she's worked with us now at the Cancer Council on our helpline for over six years. Carol has special interests in providing reliable evidence-based internet information for people with cancer and she also specialises in talking to people about body image and relationship changes after cancer. Then there's me, I'm the comms manager um, in the Cancer Information Support Team. I've also worked at Cancer Council for over six years. Um, my team works on producing the booklets, the fact sheets and the online resources um, that some of you may have come across. And I have a special interest in creating online spaces for people to connect and feel supported no matter where they live, whether that's regionally, rurally or metro. Our guest panel. We've got some great girls on board. Um, first, I'll introduce Sarah. Sarah is 36. She lives with her husband and two gorgeous girls that you can see there. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2006 at age 29. Um, her BRCA1 mutation was confirmed in December uh, 2008. After discussing her options with her specialist at Peter McCallum um, Familiar Cancer Centre, her husband and friends, but mostly other Pink Hope women, she chose to have a bilateral mastectomy in May 2010. She then had a fallopian tube removal in April 2013. Sarah adores her children, sunshine and holidays, and we very much thank her for her time this evening. Next up we have Christy. Christy's 41 years old. She works as a physio. Uh, Christy um, has a father who is BRCA1 positive and he had two sisters and a mother who all died from breast cancer. She was tested at age 18, largely on the insistence of her parents. She um, then had children at 29, 30 and 31 and had a bilateral mastectomy at 36 with her ovaries removed at 38. She has never had breast cancer. In order to help her make her decision, she saw lots of surgeons and the genetic counsellors at Peter Mac Familiar Cancer Centre prior um, to going ahead with her surgery. Um, back then, there wasn't a lot of people around to talk about preventative surgery, so she um, mainly uh, spoke to her sister, who is also gene positive um, and had had a mastectomy. Christy also found that uh, genetic counselling and support groups were useful in helping her make the difficult choice. She loves travel with family, live music and cooking, and we appreciate her willingness to be involved tonight. So thank you very much for joining us, Christy. Last but certainly not least, we have the gorgeous Sam. Um, she's sitting on the panel tonight as a family member who has supported her mum and family through some difficult choices and someone who will possibly face some difficult choices in her own future. Sam is very excited to be getting married to her wonderful fiancé in January next year and in her spare time coaches calisthenics and is trying to renovate her house. Very busy. Sam's mum was diagnosed um, 
with breast cancer at 48 and her grandmother uh, passed away from breast cancer at age 35. Sam's mum underwent a bilateral mastectomy and then a reconstruction in 2008. Um, due to her strong family history, Sam is also um, going through the process of investigating her options, the first step being genetic testing as a family. At the moment, she's waiting to hear the results of the genetic testing, so she may, so she, Sorry, she has not made any decisions about her health, but it is something she thinks about often and has discussed at length with her partner and family. Um, she also found that hearing stories um, from other Pink Hope women has helped her feel that she's less alone. And she adores chocolate, is mad about her calisthenics. She used to compete and now coaches. And she also likes trying new recipes um, from her latest copy of Delicious magazine. So she's got a lucky hubby uh, to be there. Uh, now I'd like to pass on to um, Lucinda Hossack for the more formal presentation, formal part of the evening. Um, we, you can see on your screen there we've just got um, some support services that are available to you. Uh, the Cancer Council Helpline is open 9 to 5 Monday to Friday and available in any state. Uh, just call a cancer nurse on 13 11 20. Um, there's also a Cancer Council Genetic Peer Support Program and uh, that allows you to speak to someone that's been through a similar experience um, and I guess walked in your shoes so to speak. So um, to access that you just need to call again 13 11 20. Uh, there's also Pink Hope which we'll hear more about later, Breast Cancer Network Australia and also your uh, local familiar cancer centre. So I'll now pass on to Lucinda, um, who is going to take us through the more formal part of the presentation. Welcome, Lucinda. Thank you, Jess, and thank you for setting the scene um, for tonight. Um, I will be giving a more formal presentation to, I guess, review some of the information that may be relevant to women um, with a BRCA1 or 2 gene fault um, in terms of, I guess, the options that are available to them to manage their risk and, I guess, what we understand about some of the issues that people might experience when they're faced with those choices. Um, I think you know, the most helpful part of tonight will not necessarily be this information, as some of it may be um, familiar to the audience, but rather, I guess, the input from our expert panel in providing their stories and experiences, um, which I think is incredibly valuable to women making these choices. So just taking everyone back to the beginning, I guess we know that we all have these BRCA1 and 2 genes. Um, and that the normal role of these genes are actually to protect a woman from developing breast and ovarian cancer. However, it is where a woman has inherited a fault or mutation, which is the scientific term, in either of these genes. It means that they have an increased risk or chance of developing breast or, and or ovarian cancer over their lifetime. There are many choices or options available to women to manage a BRCA1 or 2 gene fault related cancer risk and I think that is certainly something that many women can feel quite um, empowered and that, that learning of their gene test result is actually quite a positive thing. However, we also know that women are faced with these options and decision, have to make decisions about those options at the same time in their life when they are forming important relationships and making decisions about if and when they wish to have children, making, I guess, the decisions and choices more challenging. We understand from research that women making these decisions report the need for information and also support. They report that there are three phases in which this information and support can be helpful. And they can be the phase in which they are actively making a decision and for those that choose to have risk-reducing surgery, both in the period of time where they're leading up to that surgery and for some at the period of time following that surgery as well. I'm putting this slide in to, I guess, depict the lifetime risk um, that having a BRCA1 or 2 gene fault um, sorry, to depict what the risk is of developing breast cancer over a lifetime. People might have received different figures from their genetic health specialists and certainly different research studies have shown differing levels of risk. This is certainly looking at the average of risk that we see across those studies 
And I think the point of this slide is, is that it's important to remember that when we talk about lifetime risk, it really is over a lifetime and not in a five or ten year period of which some women can feel um, that they are experiencing that all of that risk in a short period of time. I think what is helpful is to put cancer risk, in, uh, cancer risk in context. So it's important to get your cancer risk that is relevant to your age and your family history. So a risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer for a woman in their 20s is going to be different for what it is for a woman in their 50s. And that's because as we live through risk and don't develop cancer, we have less risk to face. The chance of developing breast cancer associated with a BRCA1 or 2 gene fault begins to increase from the age of 25 to 30, but we actually know that most women common, more commonly develop breast cancer associated with these gene faults in their 40s. The chance of developing ovarian cancer begins to increase in a woman's mid to late 40s, but we know again it most commonly occurs in the 50s and 60s associated with these gene faults. Thinking more about risk, um, and I think this can be helpful to know because often women who are making choices about surgery um, may have made the decision, but the next question becomes about timing and when to do that. And often people can get quite concerned about, well, I've made the decision now, but I might want to wait another 12 months or two years, and so what risk do I have in a shorter space of time? And giving people lifetime risks doesn't help with those questions. We know that the chance a woman with a BRCA1 or 2 gene fault will develop breast cancer in a 12-month or yearly period is somewhere between 1 and 3% within that period, depending on what phase of life they're in. Again, um, as, we live through, as we live through years and don't develop cancer, we have less risk to live through. And so it is important that you get the right risk level, if you like, um, for you at your at your age and at your stage of life. And that can, I think, be important when weighing the benefits or the pros and cons of certain risk management options available to you. So what are the options? What is available? Well, in terms of managing a breast cancer risk, we break it down into three broad areas, one being screening, one being risk reduction, or what's commonly referred to as prevention, and also lifestyle factors as well. If we think about screening, it's important to know that screening doesn't change the risk or chance of a woman developing breast cancer, but screening aim, the aim of screening is to detect breast cancer at an early and curable stage. The types of screening available to women with a BRCA1 and 2 gene fault um, includes breast examination, and that might be by themselves and also their doctor. Breast examination is about trying to detect changes or lumps in the breast. Certainly I think it's important for women to remember that we're not expecting them to diagnose breast cancer themselves. It's more about having an awareness of what's normal for you so that you can then report any changes um, to be further investigated by your medical professional. The other type of screening involves imaging. Um, and the common forms of imaging for women with a BRCA1 and 2 gene fault include mammogram, and for women under the age of 50, a newer form of screening called breast MRI. And these tests are designed to look and view inside the breast to detect cancer. I think it's important to say that while screening is very good, and particularly with the addition of breast MRI, um, is certainly a positive thing um, in terms of being able to detect early stage cancers. We also know that screening has limitations and not all cancers can be found via screening. Not all cancers will be early stage and certainly we know that women can't use mammogram or breast MRI for routine screening during pregnancy or breastfeeding. Thinking about risk reducing strategies. So in contrast to screening, the aims of these strategies are to alter or reduce the chance of women developing breast cancer altogether. And the two broad um, types of risk reducing strategies include medication and also surgery. I want to talk a little bit about um, this option. There's, there has been some new evidence 
2 suggests that using a medication called tamoxifen, um, and it's used daily for five years, can reduce the risk of a certain type of breast cancer known as hormone receptor, receptor positive breast cancer for women at increased risk. And the studies have shown that the reduction in risk um, that women can achieve by using this strategy is around 40%. It is important to note, though, that the studies that demonstrated this reduction in risk used women at in, um, included women at increased risk, but only very few women with a BRCA1 and 2 gene fault. So whilst it's important to be aware about this, you also need to seek um, more specific and tailored information about this strategy depending on the type of gene fault, either BRCA1 or 2, um, and also your stage of life as well. But in general, um, it is a risk reduction strategy that is reversible in that if it is something that you try and don't like, you can stop. Um, you do need to keep having breast screening because the level of risk reduction that a woman would achieve does not um, protect women enough to stop breast screening. It does have some small side effects as well, small risks um, in terms of side effects. It doesn't reduce the risk of developing all types of breast cancer and certainly can't be used if women are trying for a pregnancy or used during pregnancy either. So thinking about surgery. The first type of surgery I'll talk about is surgery to remove breast tissue or what is termed bilateral mastectomy or prophylactic bilateral mastectomy. We know that this type of surgery um, for women who have not, never had a history of breast cancer is proven to reduce the risk of developing breast cancer by approximately 90 to 93 per cent, depending on the extent of surgery one has. I guess the things to know about it is it is a very effective risk reducing strategy, but it is irreversible in that once you have it done, that you can't go back. For women who haven't finished their family, it also means that they wouldn't be able to breastfeed any subsequent children that they might have. It is a long surgery and I think it's important for women to be aware that there is significant recovery time involved and it changes the way that you look as well. Thinking about other forms of surgery that can influence breast cancer risk, we know now that women who have surgery to remove their ovaries and fallopian tubes before the natural age of menopause, so in their early 40s, reduces the risk of developing breast cancer by about 50%. Women may also be aware that this surgery is often recommended um, to women with a BRCA1 and 2 gene fault to also reduce the risk of ovarian cancer as well. Things to know about this surgery, um, again, it is a very effective way of reducing both breast and ovarian cancer risk and breast cancer risk if it's done before the natural age of menopause. But again, it is irreversible. Women need to keep having breast screening even if they've had this surgery and have, their breast and have retained their breast tissue. Having this surgery means people can't have any more biological children and it does put premenopausal women into what we call a surgical menopause, so that's an immediate menopause. Um, and this can have some um, significant side effects. In saying that, there are ways to manage those side effects. And I think for any woman who has undergone this procedure and is struggling with any menopausal issues, um, please don't suffer in silence because there are a lot of options out there to best um, to help you manage those side effects and they don't always include the use of HRT, just to say. It is important for women who have undergone a premenopausal um, surgery to remove their ovaries and fallopian tubes that they continue to have checks on their bones and their heart into the future as well. Thinking about lifestyle factors, um, so we know that there are now some clear associations with the certain ways in which we lead our life and breast cancer risk. So it is important that we maintain a healthy diet and exercise, so to keep us well. But in particular, maintaining a healthy weight and minimising alcohol intake um, are incredibly important as we know that having an increasing BMI as we get older and also a high alcohol intake um, can influence and increase breast cancer risk. Whilst we can't do anything about our genes, we can do things about our lifestyle factors and I think it's important for women um, to be aware about that. So thinking about ovarian cancer risk, um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. I think this almost requires a whole session in itself. 
Um, but we do know that the risk increases after childbearing years and I think that's important because for young women who hear about um, the associated ovarian cancer risk often understandably they can have concerns about what is this going to mean in terms of my ability to have children. In saying that, um, often discussions about how to manage this risk can start to um, happen in a woman's late 30s to early 40s. So obviously there can be some overlap between these issues of fertility and managing ovarian cancer risk. Um, as many of you will be aware, there is no effective screening test by way of vaginal or abdominal ultrasound or blood test that can screen and detect an early stage ovarian cancer. So the only current available proven strategy to reduce this risk is to consider surgery to remove the ovaries and fallopian tubes and this um, confers quite a significant reduction in risk when undertaken. This slide is very similar to the one that I've just presented for the um, surgery of removing your ovaries and fallopian tubes from a breast cancer risk point of view. So I don't think there's anything new here that I have to go in, into much more detail, but just to remind people that there is help out there should they be experiencing menopausal um, symptoms. Family planning. So I guess family planning, what does that mean? It really means the decision of if and when to have children. So having a BRCA1 or 2 gene fault does not affect a woman's chance of falling pregnant or carrying a pregnancy to term, i.e. having a baby. It is important to consider though, um, and often we get the question of, well, what does this mean for me if I'm going to have a child? What does my BRCA1 or 2 gene fault mean? It does mean there is a 50-50 chance of passing on that gene fault to any um, subsequent child and there are options that people can explore in regards to having children um, and trying to minimise the chance of passing on a particular gene fault and if people want further information about that there is a technology that can be used associated with IVF if people want more information about that um, then please contact your genetic health professional. I think the more important question and the more common question that we have is what about my health during the years that I'm having my family? And it is important to be aware that the breast cancer risk that a woman faces is increased during also their childbearing years. Pregnancy itself does not cause breast cancer, but if a breast cancer is there, sometimes the hormones, increased hormones that women experience during pregnancy um, can sometimes influence the, the rate of progression of that cancer. So it's incredibly important to talk to your doctors if you are thinking about having a family or a child. Um, try and tie in some breast screening right before you start trying for, a, trying for a child. It's not always possible and life doesn't always go to plan, but if there is the opportunity to be a bit planned about it, it's sensible. It is important to keep um, involved with your doctors and have them check your breast during your pregnancy and to report any breast changes promptly. The other issue that I think is quite important is to let your doctor know when you've had the baby and finished breastfeeding because it can, time can get away um, through pregnancy and breastfeeding and so once you finish that's a good time to, to go and have another breast screen. So thinking about risk management options and family planning and life, I think what this slide is meant to demonstrate is that there are many options available to women at many stages of life and there is no right or wrong time to decide necessarily to have these types of um, options undertaken, in particular surgery. Childbearing happens for a relatively short period of time in our life. Um, and the other options in regards to surgery or medication use um, extend well beyond the years of which we choose to have a family. And while some of those um, strategies can't be used during pregnancy, um, I think that you know, it's certainly helpful for you to remain engaged with your familial cancer centre and also your specialist and to talk about all your options and to review your options depending on your life stage. So, Decisions, decisions. There's no right or wrong decision. And I think what we know is the majority of women who make a decision, regardless of what that decision is, don't regret the decision that they've made. Decisions, however, can be complex, both in making the decision itself, as well as the decision of if you're going to have surgery, what time of life to do that. 
decisions can take time and are dependent on many factors, including your life stage, whether you've got a partner or not. Um, and I think we know that those decisions don't just have an impact on the person themselves, but their partners and also their children as well. So what have we learnt um, from women who have made these decisions and in particular undergone surgery? Well certainly they've reported three things are incredibly valuable to them in that process and I'm hoping our panel might be able to expand on in terms of their experiences. But certainly we know that being informed and getting all the facts is incredibly important. Formal psychological support both for the person going through um, the surgery themselves and also their partners has been incredibly valuable. We, we know that women who go through this process are just better than women who have not had an opportunity to do so. Being involved with a psychologist is not about trying to understand whether you're competent to make a decision or whether you're mad or crazy. Um, it's more about giving you the opportunity to explore the decision itself but also how life will be and how you um, will cope following the surgery itself, um, exploring issues of sexuality, um, particularly with your partner, those sorts of issues. Connecting with other women is incredibly important and, and has been shown to be valuable for women going through these procedures themselves to get a real life understanding of what it's like. So where to get more information and support? Um, the Cancer Council has some fabulous fact sheets that have been developed in conjunction with health professionals to give patients um, and individuals and their families more information about these options. And the links are all there and will be emailed to everyone following the webinar. Other sorts of resources um, include two booklets that have been developed um, in conjunction with Genetics New South, New South Wales and again the links are there and there's one for women considering preventative mastectomy and also one for women considering um, surgery uh, to remove their ovaries and fallopian tubes. Pink Hope is an incredible website. It's an Australian website for women and their families at high risk of breast and ovarian cancer. And it's not only a website which provides information which again has had um, quite an input with health professionals, um, so it is, is information you can trust, but also um, I think the real value of Pink Hope is having a, a large proportion of women who have been there and experienced what it's like to be at high risk and share their information and experiences with you. The last thing I wanted to touch on was a resource which I think is underutilised in this area and it's a booklet um, which you can see there for the link um, to is Talking to Children About Cancer. This is a fabulous um, resource which I think gives people tips about how to discuss these issues not only about cancer but also about cancer risk as well. I think we can take the, the lessons that it, and the tips that it teaches us in that resource itself and it goes through how to approach that for children at different developmental stages. So it's a resource that you can refer to now but can also come back to as your children age as well. So I'm going to pass over to Jess who will go through some more, more slides for you about supports. Thank you so much Lucinda, that was very inform informative and very thorough. Uh, I certainly learnt a lot so thank you very much for sharing your expertise. I'll just whip through these um, slides quite quickly because as indicated earlier on we are going to send this information um, to those that have registered uh, via email tomorrow. Uh, the Cancer Council offers um, a service where you can speak um, to someone that has been through a similar situation. So they're also um, a carrier and may have been uh, um, like up to two years down the track um, with their decision making. So we offer those, that service so you can just call 13 11 20 and um, be connected to that um, free service. Another um, option um, is our uh, counselling service. Um, so we know that it's quite common for women, uh, depending on the type of treatment, to experience body image and physical changes. Um, and these can obviously affect your sense of self and your sexuality. So we offer a telephone counselling service that can assist you um, by allowing you to talk confidentially from the comfort of your own home to an expert in this area. But this service is also available um, for partners 
and um, to access a service like this in your state, again, call the 13 11 20 number. Lucinda touched on this wonderful uh, organisation before, but uh, we strongly recommend that you um, look at Pink Hope if you haven't already. Um, it's an Australian first community designed um, organisation um, which can help connect you to other women that are um, at a high risk. Um, Pink Hope have also informed us that, well, that um, shortly they will be providing new resources um, for partners as well, which is a gap in service, so um, keep an eye out for that one. Uh, there's no uh, support groups for people diagnosed with BRCA gene fault at the moment, but if you are interested in setting up a support group um, or need uh, further advice, the Genetic Support Group of Victoria um, can assist you and direct people from other states to possible links in their local area. So now we're up to, I guess, what we feel hopefully will be the most important and um, valuable part of tonight's session. Um, Carol Arbuckle, one of our most experienced cancer nurses, is going to facilitate the discussion part of the evening. Uh, please note, your questions now can be submitted via the chat box in the right-hand corner of your screen. So I'll just point that out for everyone. Yep. Can you see that? Okay, great. Everyone else can see it bar me, so that's good. Um, so just feel free to type your questions in there. Um, another thing I should add is if you would like to view the panellists on a full screen um, so you can see everyone during chat time, all you need to do is click on the participants tab up there, the blue one in the top right hand corner. Then you should see the webcam. Uh, that image of the um, wonderful panel we have here should come up. And then from there, you just need to click on the uh, icon with, um, it looks like there's three three little faces, and you'll be able to see the full screen. So um, moving forward, that's another option um, too. So I'm going to pass on to Carol. Um, before we start, I'm going to get the girls to give us a wave so we know mm -hmm. who's who. Um, first up, sorry, we're just getting the cameras working, warming up. Uh, first up, we'll get Samantha to give us a wave. Thanks, Sam. Uh, and then Christy in the middle. And then the lovely Sarah on the end there. Thank thanks, girls. Sorry, guys. We're just working ourselves out here. Oh, there they are. Great. <laughs> Fantastic. Give us a wave, girls. <laughs> so uh, I'll go through that again. We'll get Sam to give us a wave. Um, and Sam's currently going through the genetic um, testing um, phase and helped care for her mother um, after she had uh, surgery. Um, then we've got Christy in the middle. Hi, Christy. Thank you. And Sarah on the end. So I'll pass on to Carol and um, our questions. Good evening, everyone. And um, once again, I'd just like to warmly welcome you to the webinar and uh, to take this opportunity to say how excited we are to have the panellists here. Um, what we've recognised and what we know is the importance um, that people uh, can get from speaking to someone who's been in a similar situation or understands a little bit of what people have been diagnosed with the BRCA1 or the BRCA2 gene fault um, are going through. Um, just a very quick um, review, um, just to remind you um, that the questions we can't answer are questions like uh, the one that's uh, just been put up on your screen now. Um, and uh, Lucinda, I don't know if you want to expand on anything further in terms of what we've already said or you feel that's quite clear um, to people about um, why we're not answering treatment questions. Is there anything else you wanted to add into that? No. I'm just... Um, uh, it's just, I think it's just a, re a reminder that they are quite specific questions and I think understandably there's a temptation for people when you have a, uh, access to someone like Lucinda and also just with the panellists to, to want to ask some questions that you don't get time for when you're speaking with a specialist. Um, so we're, we're aware of that and would suggest maybe um, writing down some questions tonight that you think of that are treatment questions so that the next time you see your specialist you can actually speak with them about that. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just um, uh, go to turn over to the panel now and uh, talk to ask them to, to um, talk to you about some of the issues they faced. And I'll just 
wondering, uh, Christy, um, just that first question that's come up on the uh, screen there. Um, who did you talk to about making your decision and what, what sort of things did you find helpful at that time that you were making the decision? Um, I think when I was making my decision, I felt that there wasn't many people to talk to. Uh, I became a frequent flyer at the Familiar Cancer Centre and I would just, when I reached a point of crisis, ring back up and book myself back in at that point. Um, I think my association started pre-having children and went through um, the early stages of my now current relationship and uh, all the way through deciding to have children, having children and then on all the way through to I finally made my decision which probably happened over a 10 year period. Um, I did a support group through Peter Mac uh, as well dealing with uh, speaking to other women um, and that was particularly helpful, made me look at some things from different ways which I uh, hadn't thought about. I think I got quite wound up in my personal family's experience and didn't look at the topic as quite as generally as I probably should have. So that was very good. And I think I, I, think I did default back to my uh, genetic counsellor um, trying to demand more information and more research uh, until eventually I had finished having my family um, and then that was probably when I felt um, seeing the surgeons was probably the right time for me to go and um, get the information from them. Um, it still wasn't an easy decision um, and a lot of the surgeons were quite evasive. They'll make general recommendations but nobody, until I saw my last surgeon, nobody really pushed me over the line in one direction and it was probably a final suggestion from one surgeon who actually had the guts to say, if I was you, I would do this. And that's, that was probably my deciding factor, having having somebody that actually pushed me over the line after probably thinking about it for 10 or 15 years. Thanks so much for that, uh, Christy. And um, Sarah, what was your experience? What, what, um, who did you find uh, that was helpful to talk to about your decision? Um, initially, I spoke to my genetic counsellors a fair bit and talked to my husband, um, but I didn't make my decision immediately. I probably about eight or nine months later, um, while having a routine mammogram, finding a lump that had to be um, biopsied um, and waiting for the results that were thankfully benign, but that um, made me think, okay, I, I really want to do this, but I'm confused. There's so many different options. I'm a terrible decision maker. So having the fact that there wasn't just one option, um, I found really hard. So I actually um, Googled, um, which a lot of us do, and I found Pink Hope. So that was the best thing for me, just finding tons of women that had been in the same situation as me, that didn't judge me, understood exactly what I was asking, and any question I asked could be answered, um, I found that incredibly helpful. Mm. Yeah, that's certainly, um, and I think uh, Lucinda's nodding here, um, just for people, the benefit of people who are um, uh, listening in on the webinar too, that that's certainly... Um, the you know, loud and clear um, response we get in the, uh, from many, many people too is that talking with other women who are in the same situation. And I also think mm -hmm. that uh, Christy and uh, Sarah both pointed out the fact that they did need to use the genetic counselling service quite a lot at that time. Um, and certainly I think what we know is that for some people it's really important to listen into that um, uh, your sense of what you do need. Sometimes some people might find they don't need a lot of information at that point but might need more information down the, the track. Other people might find they need a lot of information and that escalates at times. There's all sorts of different ways of processing that information. So I hope just hearing from Christy and Sarah just helps people um, listening in tonight to know that's really normal and that's a really important part of, um, of what most people find helpful. Now the next question um, uh, came in from Anna, who's a 42-year-old, um, and she's just at the moment trying to make a decision um, about um, what she's going to do. And she emailed in and said to us that she'd been feeling very overwhelmed and anxious about making her decision. Um, I'm wondering if um, I can get uh, Sarah to just think back to when you were making that decision and what sort of feelings you were having at that point. Um, Reading that, I, I was the first thing I was thinking is it would not be normal to not feel like that. <laughs> like it, it's um, 
it was completely overwhelming for me. I, I um, and and for anyone I've spoke to, um, because it's the decision making and wondering if you're making the right decision, are you making it at the right time, and um, how is it going to affect your family? Um, yeah, so much. But I have to say, for me, the anxiety of getting cancer again um, was bigger than that. And I know that once I'd had my surgery, um, that relief, it was just amazing. So, um, but leading up to my surgery, the, you know, that sort of last week, it, it, it's, it's really overwhelming. Um, but I had some really good, a lot of support um, from women that had been there and gave me lots of really good advice. Um, but that's kind of pre-surgery. But um, about making your decision, I think that um, don't rush into it and ask as many questions as you can and speak to as many surgeons and just get lots of information and take your time. Christy, would you like to add anything to what Sarah said? Oh, yeah, it's only on the other side of it, so I'm six years on the other side of having made my decision, that when I see something like this, I remember that I was completely like yeah. that myself and I, um, I felt like my life was one big game of Russian roulette and I was taking all these chances and... Um, and I think having made a decision that I would remember feeling each day driving to my mammogram or ultrasound or MRI, I could just, the week, the days before and the days leading up to and the days waiting for the test results and et cetera, um, it just the cumulative effect of that anxiety was, it winds itself out over years of doing that um, and I see the decision of having a preventative mastectomy as one very big decision with a really big payoff of relief at the end of it. That's how I felt about it. And Sarah, as someone watching your mum making that decision, what sort of things... Uh, Sam, sorry. I'm sorry, Sam. Um, as watching your mum making that decision, what were some of the things as a person in the family that you noticed? Did you find yourself feeling overwhelmed at times? And, could you talk a little bit about what a family's experience is of that situation? Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess we've always had breast cancer in our family, so got mum going to have her yearly mammograms and ultrasounds was kind of just a normal part of life. But um, every year it was that scary thought, what if she's got breast cancer this year? And we had a few um, close calls where she did have um, lumps and she had um, them removed and then she did get breast cancer in 2008 and I just remember feeling so overwhelmed and unsure of what to do and what would happen and um, it's it's a scary thing to be a daughter and then knowing, oh, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to get breast cancer? Do we do we carry the gene fault? Is it um, something that I'm going to have to really worry about? So it's hard to see someone that you love so much going through... Um, that traumatic process as well. And so you'd see that as quite a normal reaction? Yeah, definitely. I think anyone that's close to you that's going through something like that, um, it's normal to feel a bit overwhelmed by what's going on and to be um, taking it so personally for yourself as well. Thanks so much for that, Sam. Um, our next question is from Catherine, um, who asks, um, with regard to prophylactic or preventative double mastectomy, um, how... The panellists, um, can we ask you, how do your breasts look and, 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 and do they... It's a fashion they... parade. <laughs> Annika, you can go first. Um, look, I think um, a lot of people who have, aren't going through this or don't really understand would think you're just having a boob job and, and people did refer to it as that, you know, when I was having my surgery. But it, it, it's not. It, um, they, however good your surgeon is I just they don't look real I don't think they do um but you know it, it, they're okay like it's yeah it's it, that's a tough question and um, they feel different they to me they feel hard and um, my husband says they feel fine but you know <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah they, they do look different I, I just recently this year made the decision to have my nipples reconstructed and I feel it so much better for doing that so that um was a real positive for me because now when I look in the mirror, I feel like I look normal, whatever that is. But, you know, um, before I felt like I just had Barbie boobs. Like it was, yeah. So um, I, I think that um, you just got to be realistic, though. They're never going to be the same as your old breasts. Christine? Yeah, I think, I think I've got a privileged position in my role as a health professional. I see lots of them. I see um, every week I see a few different post-operative breast surgeries and my clinic deals a lot with 
um, post breast care and lymphedema. And um, every year I get more and more surprised when someone lifts up and I go, oh, those ones look great. And I think, um, I think they look much greater than the women that I see who've had a mastectomy and radiation treatment. Um, and I think it's just adjusting your expectations to a new normal. And I think it's also getting your head around uh, the least worst option. So you're, just, you're never going to have anything that's looking A1 perfect. Um, but you, the, the risk reward of the relief of having it done and something that's not what you used to have but still not too bad. And, and my, my yardstick was I just wanted to look normal in bathers and a tank top. And that was, if I could do that, I was happy. Um, and I, I think I do. <laughs> thanks, thanks so much for that, Christy. And I think that's a really important point you just touched on there, that um, quite often uh, uh, that's an important thing is to actually speak with the breast surgeon and actually say, what are your goals? What is your expectation? What's the, what are you trying to achieve? Um, and it's certainly impor important to consider how you will look um, when you're exploring the option of risk uh, reducing um, mastectomy. Sometimes, um, I know when I've spoken to Lucinda, she's, she's actually told us that... Um, often asking to see pictures from your breast surgeon and the plastic surgeon um, is important um, and can help. And also speaking to other women, um, and that's certainly something the Cancer Council provides um, in terms of if you would like to speak to someone else about how your breasts look and feel, that can be a very important thing as well. Would you like to add something yeah, there? Yeah, I just want to add to that. Looking at photos in their surgery is good, but probably better is speaking to those women because... I think that some women are unrealistic about how much surgery you need to get to that stage mm -hmm. as well. Like it's not, it's often not just one surgery, and mm -hmm. um, and so you know you want to say, well, with this photo, how many surgeries did the woman have, and perhaps have a chat to her about it. So yeah. And I'll just say one other thing. Some of the stuff that I'm seeing now that I didn't have the option of six or so years ago, some of the nipple sparing mastectomies because mm -hmm. the research has changed on that, and some of the nipple sparing preventative mastectomies, um, which I see maybe two weeks afterwards. A, nothing short of brilliant at the moment. So I think um, if I'd seen those, you know, maybe in the flesh myself beforehand, it would have made my decision. Uh, um, it, it certainly seems much less disfiguring when you see these um, great results that some surgeons are getting with nipple sparing surgery as well. Okay. Um, I think Renee brings up something that must go through a lot of women's minds um, with when you have treatment. Uh, how your body's going to look and how are you going to feel about yourself sexually? Will you still feel sex sexy? Will you still feel attractive? Anybody like to share a few thoughts on this? There's only 300,000 people out there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I've just said my benchmark was being able to feel okay. I think um, that question is a little bit loaded depending on whether you're in a relationship that you're happy with at the time or not. And I certainly was when I made my decision and that hasn't changed anything at all. If, I, if I'm the devil's advocate and said if I was a single 38-year-old considering the surgery, um, would I have had any more reservations? I certainly would have. I, I, can't, I can't lie and say that I wouldn't have been a bit more worried. Um, but I certainly did lots of other things, um, did a fair bit of retail therapy afterwards to make, <laughs> to make up for it. Okay. Did you? Um. Yeah, it's, it's a, so yeah, it's, it's a, a tough question, like you say. I, I was in a relationship as well, and I, I would have been a different decision for me had I not been in a relationship. I'm not saying I wouldn't have done it, but it would definitely I felt differently about it. So yeah, it is hard. Yes, and we will touch on some questions for people who are single, just for people who are tuning in um, and wondering about that. Um, Charlotte's asking um, when she was first diagnosed. She said, um, I. Uh, she felt like she was a ticking time bomb and she's just wondering whether any women on the panel actually feel like that and how they coped with that feeling. Um, Sam, would you like to sort of yeah. talk a little bit about, even though you're not sure about your situation, what your thoughts are? Yeah, that's that's the question kind of sums up how I feel at the moment. Um, so my family's going through genetic testing um, at the moment, so we don't know whether we carry the BRCA1 or 2 fault. Um, mutation. Um, so I guess I do feel like a bit of a ticking time bomb. Do I carry the gene? Am I going to get breast cancer? Um, so I guess what I'm doing at the moment is, um, you know, doing my self-checks and I've been to see a breast surgeon to make sure everything's okay. And I guess the only 
thing to do is continue with your screening and just getting um, as much information as you can, talking to other women, like we've said. Um, I really value Pink Hope and the women there, um, people like Sarah and um, whole lot, uh, women all over Australia who are going through the same thing and trying to make a decision. Um, and there are other women that don't know whether they carry the mutation as well, even though they, you know, and they've got that strong family history. So just getting informed, I think, is the, the best thing that you can do to help with that. Thank you very much for that. Um, what about you, Sarah? What were your thoughts? Um, yeah, I, my, my favourite expression is, expression is um, damned if I do and damned if I don't, because mm -hmm. um, I'm sort of going through this with my ovaries at the moment, so whether to remove them and when, um, and it is. I, I feel like if, if I got cancer and hadn't done anything about it, I, I just don't know how I'd feel, mm -hmm. but I'm not ready to have that surgery. Um, so how do you cope with it? Mm -hmm. I think that... Um, I spend a lot of time emailing Lucinda and <laughs> calling her and asking my genetic counsellors questions. Um, I just have to just get the facts, exactly like Sam said, get the facts and um, you can only make a decision based on what works for mm. you. I think if I get to the point where it's overwhelming me so much, that's when I know it's time to take them out. Right now I'm coping okay with it. Um, but, yeah, it's really tough, but you've just got to talk to people and get lots of information. Could, could I just say to... I um, just might get Lucinda to talk here um, for a few seconds because um, just uh, prior to uh, the webinar, we were having a discussion amongst ourselves and one thing we realise is that not everybody feels like this, do they, mm -hmm. Lucinda? Some people... May I, I get you to talk a little bit about some of the reactions people might have about not feeling that mm -hmm. way? Do you mean like not feeling like they need testing? Testing, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I, th I think what we need to do is to put uh, decisions about how many women or the proportion of women that might choose to have risk-reducing surgery. We know in Australia about 25% of women with a BRCA1 or 2 gene fault will actually undergo um, a risk-reducing mastectomy. Um, and so many women actually are just remain engaged in screening. And I think it's important to remember that you're not doing nothing by being involved in screening. You actually are doing something. Um, and, and to have confidence in that because screening is good at detecting cancer even though um, it has limitations so you know these decisions are personal um, but certainly if you chose not to have surgery you wouldn't be um, you know in the minority if you like. Thank you very much for that Lucinda. And Emma wrote into us and asked us how do you decide whether to have a family or not um, with the risk of passing on the, the BRCA gene fault? Yeah. yeah, I I've done um I've done a bit of everything. I had three children and I was really worried about this. I did one my first pregnancy, uh I was fortunate enough to have a boy. My sister and I both have five boys between us and so it's a small blessing. Um I had my first child, I was just so happy to be pregnant and just was quite happy and relieved to have a boy. The second child I had um a CVS testing at 11 weeks, which was very stressful because uh, I had decided that I didn't want to have a girl with the gene after just our family history. And the third child, I went through the IVF route, which the Cinder alluded to. So I've done a bit of everything. I've, I've risked the first one, tested the second one, and made sure the third one didn't have um, the gene. Um, and I had three boys, like I said. Having said that, I have cousins who are gene positive and all of them have lost their mum uh, and none of them have decided to do or do anything at all in terms of uh, passing the gene fault on. Um, so it just shows you the same family history, same situation and people will choose to do something different. I won't suggest for one minute that the, um, the IVF or the um, genetic testing in utero were not stressful. They were some of the most stressful times I've ever had, um, probably even more so than choosing to have the mastectomy. So it's it's not something that you do lightly. And other people will run the risk that by the time their children get to our age, uh, things will have changed and uh, the world for people with breast cancer genes will be better and uh, they'll go on and have their family normally. Thanks very, very much for that. I'm just going to pass um, back to Jess now. 
thanks Carol and thanks to the panel. Um, sadly, I'm just conscious of time. Um, we have hit the one hour mark, um, but our panellists have kindly um, offered to stay on um, for an extra 10 minutes of questions. Um, we can't really keep up with all the questions that are coming through, all of them um, very interesting and um, of great value um, to both us in a supportive care sense at the Cancer Council, but also um, the panellists would like to, um, I guess, assist as much as they could. So um, for those that have to leave us now, thank you very much for participating and we do hope this session's been useful in alleviating some of the feelings of isolation, uh, knowing that there are other women out there and there are some uh, great supports available. Um, if you could take two minutes to click on the evaluation link uh, once uh, you log out of your session, that'd be great. It will just help us improve and refine these sessions further for the future. Um, we do wish you all the very best and please call on those supporting organisations that we've highlighted uh, earlier today uh, for further support. Uh, so take care and good night. Those that are staying on, uh, we encourage you to continue typing your questions in the chat area and uh, Carol will continue directing these um, to our fantastic panel for the next 10 to 15 minutes. Thank you very much and thanks for those who are leaving now and for your time today. And uh, for those of you who are still staying on, and I can see by looking um, at our list that you're actually most of you are still doing that, which is fantastic. Um, our next question comes from Marsha, and uh, she uh, hasn't had children yet, but she's been told um, that she needs to have her ovaries out. So what I thought I might do is talk with, um, get Lucinda to talk uh, on the subject first, and then the panel can give you their experience of their particular situation. I guess I wanted to say that this is quite unusual in that um, it's not, it's not um, usually the recommendation that people have surgery to remove their ovaries during their childbearing years, and certainly um, the advice from a genetics clinic would be to, to complete your family if that's what you so choose to do um, before making these sorts of decisions. Sometimes people may have um, a family member who has developed ovarian cancer at a very young age and, and that can sometimes prompt discussions about surgery. Um, but certainly from a familial cancer perspective, um, we would be uh, quite encouraging of people to, um, to really be sure um, about decisions about their about having children and and make those decisions and fulfil those wishes before they actually proceed to surgery. Any comments from the panel? Um, yeah, it's it's really hard without knowing specifics because it says that she's only thirty three. Oh, I'm, so I'm sorry. Can I just cut oh. it? I'm just asking you about your experience. Okay. I won't, won't ask you to uh, um, sort of help oh. Marsha with this particular one, but just your experience. Um, yeah, I um, I did struggle a bit though because even though I think I found I'm trying to think how old I was when I found out about my BRCA mutation, but I, I'd only had one child then, and I, I knew I wanted to have another one, but I wasn't quite ready. And so everyone kept saying, "Finish your family, finish your family." But I was thinking, "Well, I'm not ready to finish my family, and I've got this hanging over my head." Um, but fortunately, I did wait, and I have had a, another little boy. Um, actually, I think Jess said I've got two girls, and I'm oh, going to clarify. <laughs> I'm going to clarify that now because um, my husband's a bit upset with me for putting hair clips in his hair. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, I had another little boy, and um, and and I'm glad I waited. So yeah, that, it, it would be tough to be told you couldn't have children, definitely. Um, but like Lucinda said, I think that's quite uncommon. Okay. Can I just get a brief uh, word from yeah. you, Christine? Uh, I just think the uh, the value of having a family, if you can wait, certainly outweighs the. The anxiety that you might feel by waiting till 40 or mid 40s of, of this information, um, it's uh, yeah. I, I would push off the decisions that I made them in my my mid to late 30s. But I, if I hadn't had children, I, I I wouldn't have hesitated to push those decisions off until till later. Okay. Now the next one, I'm just going to slightly. Um, broaden this out because I'd like to bring Sam back into this discussion too um, but I want to ask all of the panel um, how um, how you feel you broach the conversations or discussions with your husband's partners families and and whether or not there was upset or whether you, you felt some, some strategies that tried to minimise uh, feeling upset. Um, so Sam can we start off with you and just ask you a little bit about how your mum did broach that um, was it normal to have upset in your family or did you approach it in a fairly 
um, uh, stress-free way? What was the experience? So in my whole my whole family, what we went through. Um, yep. So I guess when Mum got diagnosed with breast cancer, um, the solution, her treatment was to have a mastectomy. Um, she had DCIS, so it was spread through the milk ducts, and that was the best way to get rid of the cancer. So I think Mum kind of just came home and said, look, this is the course of treatment that's been recommended, and that's what was going to happen. So my mum doesn't have a partner. It's just me, my mum, and my brother. Um, so we were obviously supportive of her. I think my brother didn't really kind of understand what that meant. Um, I kind of went into um, supportive mode and just said, yep, okay, if this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen. Um, when it came time for mum, she was discussing with her breast surgeon about having um, the left breast removed as a preventative surgery. Um, I remember feeling that was that was tougher for me um, when we were discussing it because it meant another round of surgeries. I was by myself at this stage. My brother had gone overseas for 12 months and left me to look after mum, um, which I don't mind doing, but it was really stressful at the time. Um, so that was a tough decision. I said, do you really need to have this surgery? You know, there's no cancer there. I didn't really understand. Um, I was quite a bit... It was about five years ago, so I was a bit younger. Um, I didn't... I wasn't informed about why you would have preventative surgery at that stage. Um, and it was a stressful time going through the surgeries. But looking back now, it's definitely the best, you know, decision that mum could have made. And I have a much greater understanding of why she did it um, and why it was recommended for her situation. So I think just again, getting informed and talking to other families that are going through the same thing, it really helps. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what about for you guys, just in terms yeah. of partner? I, um, I think my, my husband, when I started my relationship, knew the entire history and probably knew the path he was going down. Um, so it's a little bit of a different situation. Sort of, you know, he always knew he was marrying me for, you know, sickness and health and all these type of things and it was always probably on the cards for us but I think that that question really um, makes me think that you un sometimes underestimate men's ability to deal with this and most of the time if you get to the very heart of it most of them really just want you around for keeps and are probably happy to go through all of this with you um, and the other, the other personal thing from seeing lots of women who go through chemo and radio um, it's a, also a very stressful time for partners and husbands and I think um, going through this type of surgery, um, you can't underestimate how stressful it can be on them at that time, but chemo and um, breast cancer risk and secondary risk is a long-term stress for partners mm -hmm. and um, most of them, I think, at the heart of them w will want you around. Can I just add to that? Yeah, um, with the, the bit about specific support handouts and um, the Pink Hope... <laughs> Um, leaflets and information that um, they're referring to is a, a sort of bunch of stuff called Man Up, um, which I think is available soon. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's going to be really great for men. It's about how that they can support women and understand everything. Um, and the specific support, um, my husband, who's probably watching this right now, but he, he's a bit of a bury his head in the sand kind of guy and didn't really want to talk about it much. So we... Um, I think at the suggestion of, of, uh, of Peter Mack, we had um, counselling together. We both went yeah. before my surgery, mm -hmm. and she um, gave us some really good strategies of how, you know, like to talk about it every day and that sort of stuff. So I would definitely recommend um, going to see, to have some counselling together yeah. or separately, but getting your partner involved. We did that too. Yeah. yeah. Thanks very much, and I really appreciate the honest feedback. That makes such a huge difference. So thanks so much for that, and and uh, a thanks very much um, to Sarah's husband out there as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're going to skip through a couple of quick slides because I really want to get to this one about Hello. for people who are out there who are single. Um, Carrie rang in and said, um, I'm sorry, Carrie emailed in and said that she's just started dating. Um, and she's just not sure about how to bring up the fact of having a mastectomy in November. Um, Lucinda, would you like to respond to that? Um, I think there is no specific answer to this. It's quite a tricky question. Um, and I, but I think there are some tips that we could potentially give talking sort of generally about how do you broach these sorts of issues. Um, First of all, it can be helpful to think about how you feel about your decision to have surgery and what are the reasons for that. Um, and because this will influence the message you give when you actually go to discuss this with your 
with your new mate, if you like. Um, I think some of the other issues to consider is that some people feel safer to start small and explain why this is important um, for you to tell them, so give them context to that. You might want to practice what you have to say with someone you trust beforehand um, and it can also be helpful to think about when and, and the location of which you're opening up this discussion. So don't do it at a noisy restaurant when you've had too much to drink or at a family function. That might not necessarily be the most helpful place um, to start these sorts of discussions. So just you know, prepare a little bit beforehand. Um, I think it's also important to say a little bit like um, what the panel have said. Don't underestimate um, how people actually can take on this information. But if your partner is taken aback in the first instance, that's okay, and I think it's important to tell them that that's okay, especially if they don't know what to say to you. It doesn't mean that they'll be unsupportive in the long term. It may be that they actually just need to time to digest what you've had to say to them. Um, I think it also can be helpful to offer how you felt when you were making this decision, um, because that also can help allow them the space um, to know that there are fears, that it's difficult, it's, it's complex, um, offer to answer any questions that they might have at a future time um, and acknowledge that this is an issue that's going to affect both of you too and, and I think you need to leave space for the, to talk about how you might deal with that if this is a, a relationship that you intend to continue to have. Thanks very much for that uh, Lucinda. Um, we're going to just go through to the next um, slide which is um, just talking about um, some of the issues that people might face in encouraging family members to be tested. Um, Sarah, have, how did your family approach that? Because you're uh, having testing at the moment, oh, aren't you? No, that's oh, sorry, <laughs> Sam. Sorry. Um, so yeah, we're getting tested at the moment. Um, we have, so my mum also has a sister and she uh, doesn't receive any screening for breast cancer. She's nearly 50 and she's only just had her first mammogram ever. My mum's been getting screened since she was 30 years of age. Um, she doesn't have any kids of her own, so I think that has impacted on her decision on how she manages her risk. Um, we have met with genetic counsellors before at Peter Mac um, and at that time we weren't eligible for um, for the testing, which um, we are we are going through it at the moment, and that was a few years ago. I remember in that um, trying to talk with her about it, she just didn't want to know, and it was really quite difficult. But over time, and with Mum of having had breast cancer, I think we speak about it a lot more, um, and it's it's quite difficult to encourage someone in your family who's doesn't really understand. Um, it's hard to explain, I guess. Um, it's been a tough time, but she's on board with it now after having spoken about it and realised how important it is to the rest of the family um, that we want to get tested. Um, so she's participating in the testing with us now. But it's been a long time. That was about five or six years ago that we initially went for genetic testing counselling. So, yeah. Um, just a few briefly, and we have to finish very shortly, but I think um, if you, either of you would like to say anything else to add to what I, I just think, said. I just think on that one, it's not really necessarily for sisters. I just know that, um, and things have changed with genetic counselling now, but when I had my test done at 18, at 18 and 20, my sisters were, it was really done on the insistence of our parents. It was very important for them at that stage to have that done. They'd lost a lot of family members to breast cancer. There was a high amount of anxiety and fear in the family and I look back at it now and think it probably wasn't the best time for us to have that information all the way through our 20s. It really just made me feel anxious for a good decade that I didn't need to be anxious for. Um, and there are some family members who've chosen not to be tested um, and I've actually come to be okay with that as well too. Um, so just because you feel this burning desire and need to want to be tested and cover all bases and have all preventative surgeries, um, I've now come to realise that not everybody, um, even in the same family, will feel that same way. And in some of the support groups I dealt with, that was a source of conflict, which you don't really need when you're undergoing this yourself. Um, um, I'm wondering if each of you could just very quickly sum up, if you can, um, what you've learnt from this whole experience. Could I start with you first, Sarah? Um, yeah, look, I've learnt a lot about myself. Um, 
I, yeah, that's a tough question. Yeah. I don't know where to go with that? Yeah, um, yeah it's interesting. I, I, what I've got from the whole experience is I've I've made a lot of friends. Um, I've connected with a lot, of, a lot of women, and I'm at a stage now where I feel like I'm giving back and helping other women in the same situation. Um, I, I, what I've learned, from, I mean, geez, I feel like I'm an expert on surgery and and genetics and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that. Maybe you guys yeah. have a go first. <laughs> I, I think there's a lot in what you're saying. Mm. That you do become the expert in yourself. Christy, what, what about yourself? Uh, I think that I would say... But I spent 10 or 15 years getting myself into a tiz over this and actually having had both of the major surgeries we're talking about, um, apart from the recovery of them, and, and there are some little hurdles afterwards, I just could encourage people to not approach it maybe with so much fear um, unless you have a high level of vanity, which I don't. Um, and, and I completely underestimated my husband's ability to cope with that whole situation through all the... IVS and testing and mastectomies and ovaries out. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, don't underestimate. And I su the support network of not just the women in breast cancer, but I just remember putting in this massive support network as I was approaching all these um, surgeries. And, um, you know, you sort of get your head up over it six weeks later and pretty much go on with nagging kids and making yeah. lunch boxes again. So, you know. I agree. Actually, the anticipation of it is way worse than, than actually what you go through. Um, and you're right, you get yourself so worked up about it. But um, the feeling now, I think I'm three and a half years post and stick to me. And, yeah, and I'm, Thank you. Thank you so much. And Sam, anything you'd like um, to add? I guess for us, it's uh, my family so far. I guess we're still on the journey and have a long way to go. But it's um, definitely brought us closer together. And I think... Like the girl said, the anticipation and lead up to surgery um, with my mum was, it's a tough time, but when you come out the other side and um, it definitely brings you closer and, you know, you've done the right, the right thing for us and it's definitely, you know, we've made so many wonderful new friends and um, you, just knowing that there are other people out there going through um, the similar thing just really helps, so... Well, thank you so much. I felt like I've learnt so much and I really, really appreciate the contribution from three very powerful and very insightful women. So thank you so much for your time. A great um, uh, th thank you. And I can hear people clapping in my ear, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to quickly pass back to Jess. And thanks, everybody, from the webinar. Um, and we've been really looking forward to um, your thoughts and we've been really enjoying the comments that you've made. We're sorry we haven't been able to get to everything, um, but we will certainly be able to... Um, um, respond to you tomorrow on the oh, helpline. I'll just hand that back to Jess. Thanks. Thanks so much, Carol. Um, again, I'd like to formally uh, thank the panellists. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do this webinar without you, and I'm sure that the, um, I guess, the um, comfort, hopefully, that you've been able to give to those that have been logging on, um, and I guess in some small way, um, helped them feel more empowered um, has been a great thing. Um, again, we are sorry that we can't get through all the questions in the time we've been allocated tonight, um, but if you do have any burning questions, please feel free to uh, call your helpline in your local state. Um, and a recording of the webcast will be available on the Cancer Council Victoria website um, in the next few days, as um, it will also be on uh, BCNA and Pink Hope's website. So we wish you all the best. Thank you for joining us this evening. And um, 